Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Glam Reaper podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Muldowney, and today's episode, we learn all about the history of cremation. You might not have known you wanted to know about it, but you definitely want to know about it. Take it away. Okay, so welcome to another episode of the Glam Reaper uh, podcast where we talk about life, love and loss with a massive input from the funeral industry because that is the world that I live in. And today's guest I am actually super excited about um, because honestly he's, well, a self-proclaimed nerd of all things cremation. His handle even on his email is the cremationist, so or the crematist actually I believe it is. But anyway, Jason is here to tell us all the things about cremation um, that I'm sure you've all been dying to know. I know I have some questions here for him. Um, And if there is any other questions that you would like to know, please feel free to leave us a comment and we will get to them. All right, Jason, welcome to the Glam Reaper. Thank you. Thanks so much. So glad to be here and be with you. Uh, It's amazing how we can get together and so distant. You're all the way up in New York and I'm all the way down in Austin, Texas. So. And I love Austin, Texas. And the reason why, and I know Larry is listening to this, <laughs> is because Larry, who was also a guest on mm-hmm. the Glam Reaper, connected us. And he, I met him in Austin, in Texas for the first time. At really? The NFDA. Oh, yes. in 2013, I think that uh, was. I yeah. believe it was, uh-huh. yep. And yeah. And it's a, a friendship that's blossomed ever since. Nice. So he's, he's, I uh, always have a special place in my heart for Austin. Yes, Texas. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. So Jason, tell us a little bit about what you do and then let's get into it. I have questions and I guess the main one I'd want to start off with, other than what you do, is um, cremation then and now. I mean, it's over 100 years old. I think it's coming up on 150 years old or something similar. Yeah, 140. Uh Yeah. Crazy. So, I mean, that kind of blows my mind because it almost feels quite modern. And I guess that's coming from little old Ireland probably because we only (laughs) accepted it what, like... 30, 40 years ago when the I, church decided it was okay. I think so. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think so. It is controversial of that just yet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about um, you, what you do right now, and then, yeah, let's get into it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I am uh, the historian for the Cremation Association of North America, and I am also the cremation historian for the National Museum of Funeral History in Houston. Uh, so if you've not been to the the Funeral History Museum there in Houston, it's definitely somewhere you're going to want to put on your on your list. And uh, it's fantastic. They're at the museum. About about eighty percent of the history of cremation exhibit is my personal collection and information that I've added. And uh, we created that exhibit. It came to completion in 2018. Uh, it was a three year uh, planning uh, and going through. So it's I'm very proud of it. Um, if you were to see it, you would understand why. Um, so, um, but in 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 the rest of my world, I am a licensed funeral director. Um, I've been a practicing funeral director for many years. Um, have spent my whole life since the time I was a teenager. Uh, well, preteen, twelve years old, I started uh, hanging out and spending time in local funeral homes and uh, wanting to learn all about the business. So. Um, so it's been that's that's been my life, um, uh, and, and it's been a it's been an interesting uh, experience being such a cremationist in a world of traditional funerals. And uh, of course, that's changed a lot in the last um, couple of decades, but especially uh, especially in the South. Um, so I am a, a licensed funeral director. Um, I am also a uh, the, I'm now my my current position is I'm the director of customer experience for a company called UPD Earns. We are a uh, one of the country's largest cremation products provider, uh, providers for uh, funeral homes and cremation providers uh, across the country. That's my, that's my real, my real world uh, that, that pay, that pays, that pays all the bills. <laughs> the adult in part. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> Luckily, luckily, I'm 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 such a lucky guy that it all just blends and melds together and creates this uh, this unique world. Um, 
that that I that I wake up in each day. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's it's fascinating, um, Jason, because I've always thought that I was destined for what I do. Um, and I know, of course, people love and you know mock the glam reaper title um that was given to me by um the the newspaper i don't know why that just jumped to the screen yeah it's been it looks like it's jumping a little bit on your side (laughs) oh yeah it it just jumped once but i don't know why okay hopefully it's okay and we'll edit that bit out um (laughs) anyway back to yeah so um yeah it's fascinating what you're saying because i've always felt like i was kind of born into this Mm -hmm. because similar to you well i didn't start as early 12 years of age well i kind of did actually because i used to practice my calligraphy uh, Mm -hmm. for art class in Mm -hmm. school and I actually used to write an epitaph. Oh, nice. My. Oh, look. Nice. I still remember <laughs> to this day. And then when I was 15, and as most Irish, you know, teenagers have to do, you have to get out and get a job. And so mm-hmm. where did we go? To the local bar. Mm-hmm. So I actually worked in a bar called The Morgue. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> so I feel like I was destined. So but tell us, how did you become so fascinated with the history of cremation specifically? So so my, my actual interest in cremation came uh, about the same time that I was um, uh, getting involved in funeral service. And it actually came from a very unlikely place. And that place is the world of professional wrestling. And I was a huge wrestling fan uh, when I when I was a kid, but especially I was a fan of a professional wrestler called The Undertaker, and his manager was Paul Bearer uh, was his uh, his stage name, and I absolutely wanted to be Paul Bearer. That was my um, that was my dream and my goal to be Paul Bearer. So Paul Bearer carried an urn around with him, uh, and that trying to find that urn because it, it was a real urn. I just knew it was um, because right. it looked like a real urn. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, but I looked everywhere uh, trying to find that urn. And in that process, I got to learn uh, about cremation, about all of those things. Not just that, you know, that, that was the kind of the, the, the final uh, screw in the urn for sure. But the thing that really did it too was uh, as a young man, my great grandfather was cremated uh, and his, his remains were placed in a ceramic urn. And that always just fascinated me that, um, and and my, my grandfather used to actually tell the joke. It was his father who passed away. He used to tell the joke. He's a pilot and he has a four seater Cessna. uh, But he was that day that he carried his, his uh, father to his rest in a, in a city here in Texas, uh, he had five passengers in the plane. And uh, the FAA would have flipped out if they knew he had five passengers in his plane. So, aviation humor, I guess. I don't know. But... Dad joke. Dad joke. <laughs> yes, it is definitely a dad joke for sure. In that case, a granddad joke. But Yeah, but yes. yeah, yeah. Well, he's a dad to somebody. That's exactly, the thing. exactly. <laughs> so, so you don't lose it just because you um, don't want other. Exactly, exactly. One but step up. My great grandfather um, was cremated. So that's mm-hmm. a long time ago. Well, so... that was. I'm not that old, honey. Now, <laughs> slow down. Slow down. <laughs> Pump the brakes. <laughs> um, um, so, so that was in 1988. So um, that was, you know, oh, the 80s. So it oh, wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it wasn't 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 that long ago. I mean, it was a little time, but it wasn't it wasn't that. Long. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, my grandparents died around then, so that's why I immediately was like, oh, it's definitely good. Yeah, you know, whatever right. before that. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Tell me how, what's, okay, well, my, I mean, I obviously have lots of questions. My biggest thing is 19, what is it, 18, sorry, 1876? Mm-hmm. First, 1876, you know, the first cremation. What did that look like? You know, the the the, the discussion started, uh, and the, the biggest driving factor that, that started the discussion of cremation, um, it, you know, it can really be traced to a, f- a couple of years earlier in uh, 1873 and then in, into 1874. Um, and it was basically the, the discussion was purification. And they, they're, you know, think about it. Medicine was not a thing. Um, embalming was not a thing. It was all of these things that were starting to become uh, discussed. Mm-hmm. But people were dying and people were being buried and the people being buried, their bodies were decomposing. 
And wow. as the bodies were decomposing, it was polluting water systems and wow. was creating illness in a lot of in a lot of larger cities. So these larger cities and doctors in general, a lot of the medical profession is what truly started the cremation movement. In fact, very few um, very few cemeteries or uh, um, uh, funeral directors in the early years of cremation actually had. Uh, crematories or, or were part of that practice. Um, so that was a huge, that was a huge part of it was the driving factor of, um, burial reform, um, and, and namely purification, um, trying to purify the body so that it wouldn't pollute the, pollute the earth and air and water. And trying to clean up. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That was the, that was the biggest, um, there there was a, a statement in the, um, why, uh, let's see, what was it? Why hide reasons or affections eyes? The grave pollutes, the furnace purifies. And it's, that's basically, you could sum up the entire cremation movement from, from the first, you know, 30 years in that sentence. Uh, that was the, that was the discussion. Of course, it, you know, moved later into um, more of a uh, business enterprise in a lot of in a lot of ways but but as far as what did it look like it looked like a you know it was a it was a, the very first of its kind um it was designed by an engineer it was a small building um about um 16 by 60 uh was about the size of the building um very very um large room where they would gather for a service that was the largest part of the building and then a very small room that had the the cremator um built as part of the structure it wasn't like a machine like we think of now as a as a cremator that you know was placed inside the building it was built as part of the part of the structure built of brick um and it was it was heated by um a form of coal called coke uh and it was the uh the coke and wood had to heat up so much they got the the uh, cremation furnace on the inside to a little over 2000 degrees um so it's a, more than more than what again what cremations take place with now um so yeah it was a it was a whole uh it was an entire ordeal it was covered in in almost every major newspaper in the country um it was wow. this it was this this um, gentleman who passed away in New York, and his caretaker was the founder of uh, the Theosophical Society. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, which is a um, it's a religion and science based um, uh, group. Basically, it's called the the Theosophists. Um, it was founded in the 1870s by Helena Blavatsky, which was a mystic uh, of the time. Anyway, she she and Henry Steele Olcott founded this this society, and one of the members wanted to be cremated. They all preached cremation. That was their you know part of their mm-hmm. uh, one of their religious ideals. Um, so uh, that being the uh, you know that being the case, they hired with the uh, um, basically with the Lemoyne crematory this first crematory. Uh, he built the crematory for his own use. It wasn't. It wasn't wow. built as a public uh, public service or anything like that. He wanted to be cremated. There wasn't a crematory, so Dr. Lemoyne built the crematory himself. Um, Henry Steel Olcott reached out to Dr. Lemoyne and said, "Hey, we want to do this cremation. Can you can you help it?" Um, so it, it was a it was an entire process. You know, there, there's so much culturally that can be can be discussed during that entire first you know that year that the first cremation took place the baron died in may and the cremation didn't take place until december and so there was discussion all throughout that time scandal and stories and sensational headlines and all of those things uh, from the very odd theosophist funeral uh, that took place in new york in may to the the uh, agreement of the actual cremation taking place uh, to the transportation and the cremation service itself. Um, so there was this huge, you know, time that that uh, that this actually took uh, to plan everything and to get everything set up and organized and ready. So um, it that that's an entire podcast on itself. That story is, <laughs> um, uh, it's, but. It's- it's fascinating and it's um i'm just curious like because honestly when i kind of said the start of 
cremation, I almost mm -hmm. imagined what still happens today, which was that people just decided to, instead of throw people in the ground, they threw them on a bonfire and, and you know, woo, you know, and, and that does still happen today culturally. Mm -hmm. Um, we know, but the fact that, and it, it honestly, it's kind of so, so interesting to me that, cause it's like every business idea starts with a want that one person has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and either goes to create it themselves for themselves or thinks to themselves other people will want this if i want it right and so right. you know this guy decided obviously he'd loads of money to, to turn one of the room for or a particular house into a crematorium just for himself mm -hmm. well he built it on he so he he actually offered to build it on the cemetery grounds for the cemetery and the cemetery could be the trustees of it and they were they said no way you know again this is the, there's not a precedent you know, there's not anything no, before this. Before and it, so, um, which right. is interesting in of itself. And as I started mm -hmm. the conversation saying, you know, Ireland, the reason why cremation is right. only taking off in the last couple of decades is because it was the church. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Catholic Church pretty right. much rules Ireland with an iron fist. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I can imagine that the cemeteries were like, uh, no. But then all of a sudden when they can make, a quick book from it, of course. Mm -hmm. they're, right. They're That's, and, oh, hmm. oh, maybe oh, I will oh. do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, exactly. Right. You know what? We need some more gilded chairs, guys. Let's do donations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously teasing anybody out there that's listening. I'm obviously teasing. <laughs> right, I right. I have opinions of these things. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. I'm just, yeah, behind my back. Uh, yeah, this is a podcast, so they can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> but anyway, um, God, that's really interesting. I never actually, uh, I never, honestly, I never really thought more enough about mm -hmm. it um, because to right. me, a lot of the, and I don't know your thoughts on this, but to me, a lot of the industry is antiquated as it is. And so, you know, the fascinating thing that my next question is, is how a hundred, we're coming on 145 years, I guess, this year, um, which is just madness. Um, how has it evolved in that time? Like what's the difference to that br oven, brick oven he basically mm -hmm. had built? Mm -hmm. What's the difference then? Uh, they were using coke, coal, coke, not mm -hmm. cocaine, people, coal. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, it's a form of coal. <laughs> uh, as a person, who, an Irish person who says half the crack the whole time, not uh -huh. that crack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> crack. Um, so obviously it's gas lines now, is it gas? I actually yeah, so know. so that's the, that's the thing, that's truly one of the most interesting things is that the, the, the process of cremation itself has not changed a lot in that time. Uh -huh. You know, the technology that goes into it and the, uh, you know, making it, uh, making it more uh, energy efficient and environmentally friendly and, you know, making, making things like that a little more. Um, and, and of course, Larry, Larry's your, Larry's your guy on process. The, that man is the encyclopedia of running a cremator from start to finish. Um, yeah. But, but as far as that process itself, that hasn't changed considerably you know the 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 start is the same the the heat the uh the end is the same the the cremated remains um and and the technology itself is the only thing that's changed with that but the you know the, even even some of the timing uh that hasn't changed considerably um <clears throat> so so it's you know it's interesting to see but but what has changed is number one the business aspect of it the way that people look at uh, cremation as a business and number two the cultural aspect of it the reason that people have have started choosing cremation so it, it, it went as far as culturally it went from being a you know something that people chose because of sanitation necessity and it transformed into you know, after embalming became more popular um, with, you know, with that advent, with the advent of medicine into everyday life, um, with the advent of, you know, germ theory and being able to truly understand uh, what causes sickness. Also think about, you know, burial vaults and all of these things that help to encapsulate and enca encase the remains so that there's not, you know, this, this threat of decomposition causing, you know, environmental issues. So, um, so, so they started to look for other reasons to, 
um, to qualify the need for cremation. And that truly transformed into uh, an era that where cremation memorials, you know, the, the idea of a cremation memorial is what truly got people to look toward cremation. Um, and that was the, that was the time frame in cremation's history that lasted you know, the, and, and built cremation. That's the, that's the time that, that built it and actually set the foundation for it and got the, got the movement started, especially on the West coast. And then, uh, in the, the Northeastern part of the country as well. Right. Um, and what percentage is it in the U S is, is it, are we asked currently? 60% yet? Oh, not quite. No, not quite. Well, I think no. we're, I think it was 56, uh, last year. Right. Um, okay. I should have had that year, handy. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're totally fine. <laughs> and last year, actually, and there's a couple of things I want to touch on in that you mentioned there because they they were quite hot topics. I'm like, yeah, no, we'll come back to that, come back to that. Um, but just while we're on it, last year, obviously, COVID. Um, I know from my experience, a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people, and I'd say across the country, across the world couldn't have funerals as we all know um and so they were choosing direct cremation as opposed to burial um because i think burial is almost associated now more with tradition and with church and with a funeral um and i have you know and obviously i know i do memorials and i have a cremation jewelry line so i'm a bit biased on certain things but Mm -hmm. um i do think that i personally think that the trend is going to keep going towards cremation well i have to tell you some interesting facts here that you probably don't know um and i'm and i'm pulling up some pulling up the information so that i have it handy here i love the i love computers this makes us (laughs) makes us so much more i thought you were going to say i love the world wide web and i was like oh that sounds so old fashioned (laughs) yeah the the inner the interwebs the the interwebs i love it As my dad yeah. says, he's like, hold on, it's gone into the cloud. Let me go ahead and grab this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me grab, grab this from the cloud. Um, so here, here's the here's the interesting thing. And this is uh, every year the Cremation Association of North America puts out the statistics of the previous year uh, yeah. and, and what that looks like. So here here's, here's something that's going to blow your mind, okay? So oh. the, the rate of cremation in 2019 was 54.6%. Okay. okay. The typical increase each year is about 1.8 to about 2.5% increase, depending on the year. It's changed a little bit. 2020, the cremation rate was 56.1%. So no different other than the incremental increase. Interesting. The difference comes in the fact that in 2019, there were 2.8 million deaths in the U.S. Oh, and then okay. in 2020, there were 3.3 million, so wow. 500,000 more deaths wow. above the standard usual increase. Um, right. well, well, about actually probably about uh, 400,000 above the the standard increase. Um, but so, it still stuck to its trend. Trending still, still, still stuck to know. its trend. The 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 rate oh. of cremation did not increase, uh, even though it seemed like there was a lot more people choosing cremation. There were, but yeah, not, just, not in relation not to the, exactly, yeah. exactly. Wow, so um, it was and a I larger think, number, but not a larger percentage. Percentage. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And um, going back to, I guess in some ways what it originally started with, which was the purification, you know, the, that idea of purification, because that was to me what I assumed was that trend of direct mm-hmm. cremation, that it was just seen as easier, quicker, smoother, you know, per- person passes away, don't contaminate anybody else with COVID, you know, swiftly mm-hmm. moving along. And obviously we couldn't have funerals. So, you know, that took that away from a lot of people. Um, in terms of though other aspects of cremation, because we've talked about burial and um, and I even know this from from even uh, Glass Nevin Cemetery back home in Ireland, you know, and um, the plague and uh, you know mm-hmm. all the um, typhoid and you know th- those mass graves, they, it was lethal. The poison that was you know was mm-hmm. killing people around them. Um, right. And I think even actually here in New York, Heart Island, isn't there a 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many. Isn't there a million bur- bodies buried there or something? I think I think there? that's it's something like that. And it's but there were you know there were a number of those quarantine islands off, you know off uh, off in uh, off the coast of of New York there, um, in the yeah. harbor. It was you know the uh, the first one of the first crematories in the country uh, was actually built on um, Swinburne Island, which was the quarantine island. Uh, and there were a lot of people that were cremated there that were um, basically they had come in on ships that were um, and they had some sort of illness, typhoid and uh, cholera and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's the Irish bringing it in. <laughs> Joke. Thanks a lot. We just brought it. But but <laughs> but something something to something to consider, though, uh, along the line of that discussion, the difference in then and now. Um, you know, with, with regard to cremation early on, the only thing that cremation changed was they went to a crematory instead of going to a cemetery. Mm -hmm. There was still a funeral. There was still a service, um, typically at the home of the deceased. Um, and then the, and then instead of going to the cemetery, they went to the crematory. Now, mind you, this is, you know, we're talking a, a, a very small number. I, I remember reading a, a newspaper article, um, because I sit around and read newspapers from 1910, you know, um, because that's who I am as a person. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I'm reading this article and it's the, the headline is, you know, it's got this really fascinating graphic on it too. That's for the Chicago Tribune. And it says, is man's last earthly right to be the purifying flame? More than 50,000 people have chosen this method of cremation or this method of, of disposition. 50,000. So that's from 1876 to 1910. A total of 50,000 people. That's an impressive headline. I like the headline. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, oh, it's fantastic. And you should see the graphic that's with it. You know, it's got the torch well, and the urn. And... Because I think that's got to be the, yeah. your your promo for this podcast. For sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I will. Everything. I will. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> that is um, so, so that's the, you know, that's interesting to, interesting to see that, you know, that that's the case, that it's a, um, that, that, that few people think about, you know, just last year in, in our discussion that we were just talking about, how many people have been, you know, have chosen cremation? It's in the millions, you know, it's yeah. one, I think 1.6 million, something like that, that, yeah. can I closed my, closed my graphic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's, so. But that's per year. Um, and, yeah. and so, okay, actually on that figure, it kind of brings me back. Actually, I like this. You're looping back on, on your, on the own red, red spots that I was like, we got to talk about that is the controversy around, you know, the toxins that, um, crem- crematoriums, you know, put out, like nobody wants, councils back home in Ireland and in the UK, you know, will fight against a crematorium getting built in the middle of a field or, you know, New York won't allow one in within its city walls in London. Mm -hmm. They talk about your breathing in the dead. Like talk to me about, you know, what is the amount of CO2 that it's expelled? What is the dangers? And I know we have the abatements and stuff, but nearly Mm -hmm. if you can talk to me, touch on pre Pre the the new you know the environmental the EPA a, um, the agency I know I has... can't I can't tell you because it wasn't oh, okay. it wasn't measured there oh, there wasn't wow. there wasn't discussion that that didn't become a discussion until the seventies when you know when the environment became started becoming but but not just that but you have to realize that such a smaller number of you know the cremation rate didn't you know exceed ten percent until until the 1970s so you know right. we're, we're talking again about it's not a massive number that number wasn't discussed you know in in the in the days past that that um impact on the environment was not discussed it wasn't it wasn't even a discussion because again number one so few people were choosing cremation and number two uh that it wasn't you know, it wasn't a uh, hot topic. It wasn't a, um, a, a talking point for, for anything. 
Yeah, it's kind of like um, how, <laughs> I don't want to make it so blasé, but it's kind of like how mental illness and obesity are, you know, such trendy topics now where I know growing up in the 80s, you know, were we, you know, did we go for McDonald's? Yes, there is McDonald's in Ireland, by the way, for anybody who's, you know, we did, we did have that, um, you know, and but that was like our treat and we did have a treats cupboard and stuff, but we ran around and we did things, whereas now obesity is such a hot topic especially in children and it's especially over here it's huge and then mental yeah, illness yeah. is an absolutely massive topic but again we didn't know about it and so who's to say what happened before were things measured you know right. we can only go by what was recorded in history i guess is, is and and, that, and that's the thing that's the thing that that is that is difficult too you know that the, these are all topics that are are very very culturally significant for us now um when when we look at history uh it's it's it was a very different experience you know the 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 world but you also you know you think about all these things and this is you know this is a, the tangent that i warned you about earlier that you know the 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 world is a different place you know we're not we're not the same people that we were then we may be the same human beings but we're not the same society that we were uh, in 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 many many ways thank goodness you know um what what a world the what a mess the world was in a lot of places but ignorantly did not know any better so um and and especially here here in the u.s in a lot of ways yeah absolutely and cremation today i mean in your opinion and i you know i did talk to larry about this as well um we do have the abatement, uh, you know, we do, we, there is restrictions to a certain extent on crematoriums. Do you think it's enough? Do you think we should be doing more? Um, should the funeral industry be more responsible for the environment? It is such a hot topic now, you know, it's like asking McDonald's to be responsible for, you know, obesity, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) is, um, you know, is the funeral industry, it's such a, it's such a sensitive, topic and industry um that sometimes i do wonder you know are we getting away with murder <laughs> forgive the phrase but are you know w- when it comes to pollution and, and things like that like burial is you know going to keep going lower and lower i think um as we you've just said cremation is incrementally creeping and getting closer to that hundred percent whether right. it'll ever get there i don't know but you know in your i, I opinion, don't i don't think it'll get there but but yeah so <laughs> so i i i will i will tell you opinions um yeah this isn't you know maybe there maybe the disclaimer is is not that um uh, th- this doesn't reflect my my the the cremation association stance on uh, the the uh, necessarily. I mean, it may be may be very similar in a lot of ways, but you know, we can always be better. We can always do better. We can always yeah. um, make make better choices uh, with regard to our industry and do what what our part is to help to make the world a better place. Um, I will personally say. That I think that there are other parts of society that could do a whole lot more than you know to, to and and the impact of their little bit that they could do would be an entire change of the funeral industry. You know, right. I don't have numbers on on things, but I but I don't. Okay. I think that I think that if we were to change so much of the things that need to be changed, you know, it th- that's going to be. Here, here, here's the truth. Okay, the the hardest things that people find to change have to do with the things that make them feel like they're comfortable, and the things that we do at death, though they're changing a lot, they want to be comfortable. It may be in the back of their mind, consumers' minds, that you know we need to be we need to be you know. Um, environmentally friendly and we want to think about the feelings of others but at the end of the day what makes them feel comforted is what's going to be the paramount and the the thing the truth of it is that that doesn't change and if you think about how slowly the cremation rate alone has changed 
you know, this is something that's 145 years old, yet here we are, and, you know, we just hit 50%, just half of the, half of the, the, um, people who die in the U.S. are cremated. So, so I mean, if you think about that, that is such a slow tradition. Death mm-hmm. is such a slow tradition uh, to change. And, and therefore, funeral directors are s- the slowest people, funeral, the funeral profession in general, are the slowest people to make changes to. And it's, yeah. it's simply because we as funeral professionals experience on a day-to-day basis the fact that people return to tradition. People return to the things that they feel are traditional things that need to be done at a time of death. And there are so many people who are, who are changing that the way that they think and consumers are changing the way that they think. And that's fantastic. But at the same time, you know, we need to realize that, that this is a slow process. That being the case, I feel like there are so many things in other parts of the, of the world in the other parts of the country that could that could make much bigger impacts with much smaller changes than the funeral profession. Right. And you know, you you pointed out that it hasn't changed a lot in 145 years, but it has changed somewhat. I mean, from your first description of that brick and mortar crematorium, it's no longer mm-hmm. brick and mortar. 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 <laughs> Say that right, Jen. Um, it's no longer that. <laughs> it's more of a unit. It's like a, typically a, a machine now, right? Is there any brick and mortar still going? Absolutely. The, the entire inside is brick and mortar. Right. And, and that's the, that's the, that's the thing is, is that part hasn't changed. If you were to look at the right. inside of a cremation chamber now and look at the inside of the first cremation chamber in the country, it it's, hasn't it's, changed. it hasn't changed. Size has changed as all. Right. But there, and it, the but technology it, around it has changed. Yeah, but it, and it's still, well, it's not coal, as we said. It's gas now, but there is electric right. ones, right? So there is machines now, no? Yeah, it's, they, are, they are machines. Right. Um, yeah. And, it's, and, the, and the, the electronic part isn't, you know, that doesn't have to do, that runs the machine. I bet you didn't know any of that about cremation. I personally found this conversation really fascinating, but that was only part one. We've got part two coming up next week, so stay tuned. And as always, any comments, feedback, or questions, send them to glamoryforpodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next week.